Good evening. Let's stand together tonight. We're going to start off by singing, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, sing a song that, uh, an old hymn that calls the church to do the work of the church. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up stand in his strength alone the 
arm of flesh will fail you. He dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next a victor song. To him who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, We'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues till the day every eye and heart shall see him. so spirit come Put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace, we hear the calls for the day when with Christ we stand in glory we hear the calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory let's pray together tonight Heavenly Father we thank you Lord for all your blessings thank you Lord for who you are for what you desire to do in our lives Father we look forward to what you will do, Father, in and through us. Father, I pray that you would move and work tonight through all that is said and done, the reading and the preaching of your word, and all that we do, Lord, may you receive honor and glory and draw us closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you went home and watched football, go Chiefs. They won. There's another one on tonight, but who cares, right? Amen. It's not the Cowboys, so I really don't care. All right, so it's question and answer uh, night. So what we're going to do 
is try to answer a few of these questions. I'm going to answer all but one. One was asked by one of our kids. And so after the Lord's Supper, when all the kids come back, I'm going to answer that one uh, final question with the kids um, in here. The first question that I got was, where did the Nephilim come from? Uh, that was, uh, that's a question that, that we've had in the church uh, ever since the Bible was written. All right? And that is a question that cannot be fully answered. But I found a video that does a pretty good job of answering that question. So if you all will, go ahead and play that video for us. Who were the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6, 1 through 4? We're going to answer that question. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 refers to the sons of God and the daughters of men. There have been several suggestions as to who the sons of God were and why the children they had with the daughters of men grew into a race of giants. That is what the word Nephilim seems to indicate. The three primary views on the identity of the sons of God are A. They were fallen angels. B. They were powerful human rulers. Or C. They were godly descendants of Seth intermarrying with wicked descendants of Cain. Giving weight to the first theory is the fact that in the Old Testament the phrase sons of God always refers to angels. A potential problem with this is in Matthew 22:30, which indicates that angels do not marry. The Bible gives us no reason to believe that angels have a gender or are able to reproduce. The other two views do not present this problem. The weakness of views B and C is that ordinary human males marrying ordinary human females does not account for why the offspring were giants or heroes of old men of renown. Further, why would God decide to bring the flood on the earth when God had never forbade powerful human males or descendants of Seth to marry ordinary human females or descendants of Cain? The oncoming judgment of Genesis 6, 5 through 7 is linked to what took place in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Only the obscene, perverse marriage of fallen angels with human females would seem to justify such a harsh judgment. As previously noted, the weakness of the first view is that Matthew 22:30 declares, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. However, the text does not say angels are not able to marry. Rather, it indicates that angels do not Mary. In addition, the verse is referring to the angels in heaven. It is not referring to fallen angels who do not care about God's created order and actively seek ways to disrupt God's plan. The fact that God's holy angels do not marry or engage in sexual relations does not mean the same is true of Satan and his demons. View A is the most likely position. Yes, it is an interesting contradiction to say that angels were sexless and then to say that the sons of God were fallen angels who procreated with human females. Females. However, while angels are spiritual beings, they can appear in human, physical form. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have sex with the two angels that were with Lot. It is plausible that the angels are capable of taking on human form, even to the point of replicating human sexuality and possibly even reproduction. Why do the fallen angels do not do this more often? It seems God imprisoned the fallen angels who committed this evil sin so that other fallen angels would not do the same as described in Jude 6. Earlier Hebrew interpreters and apocryphal and pseudopigraphal writings are unanimous in holding to the view that fallen Fallen angels are the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. This by no means closes the debate. However, the view that Genesis 6, 1 through 4 involves fallen angels mating with human females has a strong contextual, grammatical, and historical basis. That answers the question, who were the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6, 1 through 4? Research this question further on our website, gotquestions.org. Be sure to click subscribe and check out these other questions. Well, that answers that. If y'all have any questions, Jerry McCarty's going to come give a financial statement in a little while. He'll answer any question you might have. <laughs> there were two reasons I showed that video. One is, I think they do a fair job of giving you all the options. The other reason is gotquestions.org. It is a great website that will answer. I, I found questions on there I didn't even know I had, you know about the Bible and, and, and Christ and what we believe about the Bible. Uh, and he's one of us, the guy who, who, who writes all of it. And so it is a great resource. Now, 
Who do I believe or where do I believe the Nephilim come from? Well, I believe that they came by the allowance of God. Now, how they got here, I don't know. I'm, I'm split kind of between the fallen angel theory, and that's all it is, is a theory, and the line of Seth. Problem is, in Scripture, if you're going to go with Seth, uh, being from that godly line, every time the Bible mentions sons of God, every time, every time. We're going to talk about one of those times before I'm done. Every time that the Bible mentions that, it's either talking about fallen angels or angels. So, you know, there's that, you know. I think at the end of the day, when it comes to things like the Nephilim, we don't know, and that's okay. That's okay. How many of y'all have ever studied that? Where did they come from? How, all right, let's take a poll. Let's just take a poll. How many of y'all believe it was fallen angels? A lot of hands went up, fallen angels. How many of you believe something other than fallen angel? Wow. Either, either nobody agrees with me in between, or you're too afraid to raise your hand. One, one of the two. One of the two. At the end of the day, we really, we really don't know. Uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to look at a few verses here, but mainly verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 4. The Bible says this, And coming to him, that's capital H, coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then, in verse 7, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you, the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This whole text is talking about the church. It's talking about us, us who believe. Not just the church at West Side, but the church. Every person who is a born-again believer in Christ. The Apostle Peter writes and says that we are being built up as living stones. That not just in Arkansas, not just in America, but it's across this world that we are being built up an alive church. I said we are being built up an alive church. Amen. We are alive. That's good. It's good to know. Yes, that's who we are. This is not a dead place. This is an alive place because it's built up of people who know Christ. And to know Christ is to live. It's life itself. In verse 5, this was a question though. In verse 5 it says that we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And the question was this, what is a spiritual sacrifice? What does that mean? It's a good question. It's a good question. Most people, let's be honest, in the church, they read over that and keep going. Just say, oh, spiritual sacrifice, that's what we're supposed to do, amen. I don't know what that is, but that, amen, you know. A spiritual sacrifice would be to come and worship on Sunday. This is a spiritual sacrifice. Just think, you could be at home watching the Detroit Lions right now. Just think. But you have sacrificed that time to be here. Y'all, I'm using that as such a minor reason, right? It's so minor. But you're here. You, you could do anything that you wanted to do on a Sunday night, but you sacrificed your time to be here. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't feel like it's a sacrifice at all. I enjoy coming to church. I'm excited about coming to the Lord's table. I'm even excited about business meeting, Weston Graham. <laughs> Weston asked me before church. He said, is this business meeting night? I said, it is. He said, oh, 
I said, why are you up? He said, I always go to sleep on that night. He said, I, it just puts me to sleep. But I, I like church. I like coming to church. If I wasn't a preacher, I'd still go to church on Sunday night. I don't think it's necessarily a sacrifice, but you could be anywhere. When you share Christ with someone, that is a sacrifice. When you give into the offering plate, that is, or it can be, a spiritual sacrifice. It should be a spiritual sacrifice that you are giving back in honor to the Lord. So what is a spiritual sacrifice? It's anything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you give a cup of water to someone who's thirsty and do it in my name, you've done it unto me. You've done it unto me. So that is what a spiritual sacrifice is. All right, take your Bibles and turn with me over into the Old Testament. And this will be the last one we'll answer right now. Got another one. But again, I want to be sure. I'll tell you who it is. It's Everly. Is she here tonight? Is she back there? She's not back there. Well, I'll go ahead and answer it now then. I, I meant to ask you all before we started church. So you can tell her my answer. All right, there you go. There you go. Turn over to the book of Job. Way over in the Old Testament, the book of Job. Chapter 1. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, And there, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now look in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth, walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, and a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, if you put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, uh, the power, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out. From the presence of the Lord and smoke Job with bulls from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. So, you, if you know the story of Job, you know what's happened in chapter 1. He lost it all. He lost everything. His children, his servants, his camels, his oxen. He lost everything. Everything. Except his wife. And you remember what she says later. Why don't you just curse God and die? And you know as at that moment Job looked up to the heavens and said, Really? This is what you left me with. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'm not saying all wives are like that. I'm just telling you that and what. Job lost everything. You see there in chapter 1, you see Satan in the throne room with God in his very presence. You see it again in chapter 2 where Satan and God have this conversation as the sons of God are there in the throne room of God. There's that term again, right? The sons of God. Of God. Well, Satan's there. So the odds of maybe other fallen angels being in that room are high. The idea of other angels being in that room, maybe Michael, the archangel, maybe being in that room, are very high. Who are the sons of God? Well, most people will believe them as angels in that room, kind of a boardroom type setting uh, with God. And God and Satan are having a conversation. It's crazy, isn't it? It is crazy. And Satan says, yeah, you took all his stuff. Any man gave up his stuff for you. But if you touch him physically, if you hurt him, he'll curse you to your face. And God does something that I hope he never does in my life. He looks at Satan and says, you can have him. Anything you want to do to him, but you can't take his life. And God... Give Satan power over Job's flesh. And, and brothers and sisters, it got rough. The question was, I think, twofold. One was about the sons of God. What, you know, what is that talking about? 
But the other question was, it says there in chapter 2, I think it's verse 6. Uh, let's see. Let me tell you right. Uh, no, it's not. It's verse 3. It says, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man. The idea was, so here God says that Job is blameless. I thought Jesus was the only one that was blameless. Isn't that the way the Bible describes Christ? Well, yes and no. <laughs> what God is saying about Job is not that he is sinless. What God is saying about Job is in this moment, for this time in his life, he has not done anything that has caused this to take place. I went to my first church, uh, preached in view of a call. I preached in view of a call twice there, uh, two different Sundays. And I think it was the second Sunday. It could have been the first. But I made the statement that any type of illness that we have uh, this side of heaven, the reason we have it is because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes the reason we have that particular illness in our life is because of sin, but not always. Not always because of an individual sin. Now, what I didn't know, um, it wouldn't have changed what I said. I, I said scripturally what was right. But what I didn't know is there was a lady on the back row with stage 4 cancer who was dying. And here's what she heard. And she died this way. And it's very sad, but I went to be their pastor, and the first week on the job, she died. She died from cancer. And, and here's what she did. She became very angry with what I had said. And what she heard was, I have cancer because I have done some horrible, heinous sin. Now listen, what, what Doug would never say, nor any other Christian with any biblical sense, I would never walk up to anyone and say, well, I bet you got that because you messed up. Well, I'm not God. I don't know that. And it's none of my business. I would never make that statement. But what I did say is sometimes it's that way. Because sometimes it's that way. But every time it's because we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to this side of heaven, what we call good people, even though there are none good, no, not one. Right? It's a direct quote from Jesus, so it's got to be right. Amen. Job, in this moment, he was blameless. He hadn't done anything to cause this. He had not ever cursed God. He was a righteous man. He served the Lord. Listen, I would say the same for a lot of people in this room. A lot of people in this room that I know personally and have served beside for several years, I would say they are righteous people. They serve the Lord. Do I think you're sinless? No, no, I don't. But I do think you're righteous. Because overall, the majority of time, you try to serve the Lord. You don't curse him to his face. But we all sin. Job had sinned. Job had fallen short of the glory of God. Job had to make that statement, I know my Redeemer lives. He knew he needed a Redeemer, just like everyone else in this room needs a Redeemer. Everyone on planet Earth needs a Redeemer because of our sin. And by the way, how do we know he's righteous? He needed a redeemer. <laughs> he knew that. He knew that. So what God is saying is that in this moment, Job has done nothing wrong to cause this in his life. And we know what's happening. God's proven a point to Satan. And y'all, I hope he never proves a point to Satan in my life like he did in the life of Job. But if you want a great read, if you want a great study, study the life of Job. So the next question was this, one I wasn't going to answer till the end, but I'll go ahead and answer now. And this, I think, was written down exactly how she said it. It was this, in the new heaven. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, we got some kids that they're coming up with some questions, y'all. How old is Everly? She's six. All right, this was a six-year-old question. Here we go. In the new heaven and new earth, will God be invisible like he is now? That's from a six-year-old. Some of y'all are 76, and you wouldn't come up with a better question than that. That's a good question for question and answer night. He's better than the Nephilim, I'll say that. Amen. <laughs> if you want to, you can turn your Bibles, or you can just trust me. But in Colossians chapter 1, the answer to this question is answered by the Apostle Paul. He answers it in verses 13 through 20. He says, For he, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us 
to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Verse 17 is my life verse. He is before all things, and in him all things consist or hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say whether things on earth are things in heaven. The Bible says in verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1 that he is the image of the invisible God. Will God be invisible when we get to heaven? Yes and no. Yes and no. The Father will still be spirit. The Father will still be the same. But God will not be invisible when we get to heaven. God is Jesus. Amen. And listen, all throughout the Old and New Testament, when you see God physically here on this earth, you are looking at Jesus. Jesus. And one of the best stories in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, now Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a clue what he was talking about. He just knew there was something different down in that furnace. And he makes the statement, it looks like one of the sons of God. Now, if you've got a, a King James Bible, it'll say the son of God. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know who the son of God was. He didn't know who God was. He had many gods. He said, there's somebody down there that looks different from anything I've ever seen. And we know that in that fire... We Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I believe with all my heart it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the visible image of an invisible God. And when we get to heaven, he'll be the one seated on the throne that we see. Now listen, the Trinity is hard to explain, especially to a six-year-old. It's still hard with an 86-year-old too, I'll be honest. But it's believed by faith. But when you think about the Trinity, you think about God the Father who is spirit that you can't see, God the Son who is flesh that you can see, and God the Holy Spirit is the God of the flesh and the spirit that turns loose on his people and on his church. God the Father is seen throughout the Old Testament. God the Son is seen in the Gospels of Christ. And then God the Spirit is seen afterward teaching and growing and moving the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seen today. He was seen this morning. Amen. I hope he's seen tonight as well because he's here. He's here. All right. I hope that answered the questions. If it doesn't, rewrite them and I'll do it again. All right. Don't rewrite the Nephilim one. I don't want to go through that one again. I studied that this week. Studied that quite a bit this week, you know, and it was, it was funny that I preached on Noah this morning, which the flood came, many believe, because of the Nephilim. That's why God destroyed uh, the earth was because of those great big giants, you know. And I went down a rabbit trail of, of reading stuff about did they survive the flood. You know, boy, there's some odd ideas out there, odd ideas. I had a preacher tell me one time, said, I bet you're one of those weirdos that believes that the Nephilim came from those fallen angels. I, I was, I'd probably been preaching six months. And I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't have a clue what that guy was talking about. I said, well, I don't know. I might be. And I walked off. I better study my Bible. What I better do. I don't know what he's talking about. Listen, people get all sidetracked about things like that. And it's good to study. It's in the Word of God. It's good to study. But sometimes it's good to lay it down and say, Lord, I don't know for sure. But what I do know is the things that I do know I'm going to live out. All right. So we're going to go into business meeting. Isn't that exciting? Woo, business meeting. No, it's not that exciting. So we're going to pray, and we're going to pray over this meeting.